minutes up there, but I think we got everything straightened out. And uh, Ken Zeri does have receipts, so if you didn't get a receipt, uh, please stop by after the meeting at the table out front, and he'll get you fixed up on a receipt. Um, as we typically do, I'd like to go around the tables, and, and if you could just introduce yourself and, and uh, who you're representing, uh, we'll just go through the room. Uh, Mr. Brace, you want to start? Yes, uh, Tom Brace, State Fire Marshal. Katie Bjorgi, State Fire Marshal's office. Rowan Bremer, Gardini Fire Equipment. Chris Johnson, TVA Fire and Life Safety. <coughs> I'm Doug Mitchell with Simplex Grinnell, Grinnell Division. <laughs> Andy Schuster with Simplex Grinnell. Uh, Richard Ishi, Simplex Grinnell. Dale Lesson, Simplex Grinnell. Tom Miller, Simplex Grinnell, Grinnell. <laughs> Tony Bickle, Global Risk. Bill Davis, Industrial Risk Insurance. Kathy Rutherford, IRI. Nick Cannon, Global Risk. Uh, Steve Walter, IRI. David Cook, Response Fire Protection. Jeff Jacobson, Harris Fire Protection. Peter Rosak, Road Royal Medical Center. Bill Calder, Robinsdale Fire Department. David Holy, New Mac Companies. Dave Kramer, Crane Engineering. Kevin Opitz, Simplex, Cornell. Doug Rivers, Cornell. Maybe I'm not sure like it. Pradeep Gupta from TKDA Consulting. Dave Nelson, Fire Troll and Vital and Cable. Mark McDaniel, the Navigate Associates. Jeff Harper with Ralph Jensen and Associates. Tracy Banger, Ralph Jensen and Associates. Joe Powers with Ralph Jensen and Associates. Randy Tucker with Ralph Jensen and Associates. Rich Pearson with the State Fire Marshal Division here keeping an eye on the consultant. Uh, <laughs> 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 Vice Garrison. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Landy with Jane Jackson Sales and Voice and the Wolfwood Contractors. Chris Kendra, Jane Johnson and Mullis. Teresa Kimler, Innovation. Ed Meyer, North Fire Design. Dan Mullins, Service Fire. Bruce Gendry, Hastings Fire, Hope we find Jim Kempel, Midwest Fire Protection. John Hoppy, Harris Fire Protection. Jeff Sutton, FM Global. Uh, Bruce Smith, Reynolds Alliance. Paul Watercut, Joe Fire Consultants. Bill Hoppy, Harris Fire Protection. Dave Zunke, Harris Fire. Chuck Rabb with Gilbert Mechanical. Thank you, and I'm Al Moore with Michelle Cooley Erickson Engineers. Warren Anderson with Summit Fire Protection. I was just handed the uh, copy of the Governor's Council report. Uh, Scott Futrell is our liaison with the Governor's Council and I haven't had a chance to read this quite honestly. Uh, I don't know, Kathy, do you want to try to fill in a little bit? Okay, let's let's leave it that uh, I've got these minutes here. I'll, I'll just read a couple of things. Uh, one is that there's a Governor's Day at the State Fair that uh, they wanted to point out that it's becoming bigger and bigger every year and they're trying to get that organized and, and set up a, a booth for possibly the, uh, the MFPC, which is our group, or the NFSA group to get more involved with that. So if there's anybody that's interested in that, um, you could probably contact Scott Futrell about that or uh, I believe Dan Bernardi uh, at the State Fire Marshal's office has been helping with that over the last couple of years. trying to read his footnote. It sounds like they're going to try to get an article put together to circulate that uh, is going to be available in March to kind of 
tell what they have been doing and, and what their uh, some of the goals have been. Um, I guess I've, I've got their uh, annual report up here, and if anybody's interested, I guess I'll, I'll leave this information for, for you to take a look at. Um, Ken, are you here? Oh, yeah. I'm here. You want to do a, your usual long treasurer's report? Sure. We have $1,540 in our account right now. 1540 Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, I've got a copy of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers Adopt a High School program. It's a brand new program that they put together. A lot of time went into it. And this is just an explanatory uh, explanation of, of how to get involved with it and how we could do that here. If there's people that are interested, uh, please see me about that. Um, I've been involved with the committee that's putting that together a little bit. Okay. Well, tonight our, our speaker is Mr. Tom Brace of the Minnesota State Fire Marshal's Office. Probably doesn't need an introduction, as I'm sure most of you know him. Um, and as you know, it's it's always important to, to hear what they have to say. He's, the State Fire Marshal's Office has spoken every year for for several years here and, and uh, helps to guide us in our, uh, our industry. Uh, Tom's going to speak on separate financial independence for the State Fire Marshal's Office and also I believe he's going to touch on code standards and, and policies at the State Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Brace. Uh, I was reflecting a little bit on driving out here. Um, I started in this business in 1975 when I was named to the Seattle Mayor's Task Force on Arson. As I was thinking of that fact, I also, uh, the radio announced that uh, Tiger Woods was born in 1975. <laughs> and I felt a little old. Uh, and then I came into this room and saw several of you, and, <laughs> and didn't feel too bad. <laughs> John, no, you only kid the people you like. There's a fellow walking along a beach, and, a, and the proverbial bottle washes ashore. And he grabs the bottle and wipes the sand off the bottle, and of course, the genie uh, pops out of the bottle and says, um, uh, I'll grant you any wish that you want. And of course, this fellow was on the west coast of the U.S. and he was, the Pacific Ocean was in front of him and he said, all my life I wanted to go to Hawaii, but I'm afraid to fly and I don't like boats and I'd like to drive. <laughs> and the genie said, my gosh, what a request. Uh, you know, think of all of the, the material that we'd need to build a bridge from uh, west coast of the United States to Hawaii. And the genie was beside himself and so he said, well, do you have any other wish that you would like? Anything else? And the guy thought for a moment and he said, I'd like to know what women really want. And the genie paused and said, are we talking two lane or four lane? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling this story for a colleague at the table here who, who informed us after two years of marriage that he had not taken his honeymoon yet and, and the rest of the folks at the table were urging him to uh, accomplish that fact <laughs> uh, for his own survival. <laughs> I've got a number of things that I'd like to talk to you about, uh, but I'd also like to uh, uh, engage in a dialogue. So please, uh, if you have a question or a comment, 
uh, and I don't mind being interrupted. I can actually uh, uh, get back on track, uh, but I, I would be interested in some of your thoughts. I'd like to say a few things, quite frankly, that I've been wanting to say for some time. Uh, I mean no offense by them, uh, but I do uh, enjoy this group. I've had the opportunity to speak a number of times before in front of this group. I've been your marshal since 1987. Uh, and in Minnesota, in the prior 10 years, I was the fire marshal of the state of Washington. I'd like to tar start with a uh, something that's very topical. Uh, clearly, if you uh, read your newspaper, uh, listened to the various media outlets, uh, the governor's budget was announced. And depending who you are, uh, some decry it is uh, much too... Uh, uh, restrictive or much too lean others uh, depending on your political bent uh, uh, it's still a, a tremendous expenditure of state re resources and it's not my role to uh, to argue uh, uh, whatever point of view other than to make a few comments as it pertains to the state fire marshal division the state fire marshal division goes back to 1905 I'm proud of that uh, it is an organization it uh, when we want to talk about the state fire marshal, I'm talking about an organization, a division, currently is in the Department of Public Safety. Uh, but it's not a, a fly-by-night program. It's not something that, that uh, somebody thought up uh, as a gee whiz, uh, uh, let's try something new. 1905. By 1913, the legislature, in its infinite wisdom, I want you to remember the term infinite wisdom, uh, decided that there needed to be a way to fund it. I think that's very, very important. So it started in 1905, and then by 13 they needed to fund it. So they decided that a third of, of a percent of the homeowner's insurance premium volume that's sold in Minnesota, whether you're uh, domiciled in, in Minnesota, the company, or a foreign, foreign company, domiciled outside of Minnesota, a third of a percent, and that went was dedicated to fund it. And that went along pretty well until about 1937, they realized maybe it ought to be about a half a percent. And so they upped it to about a half a percent, and it continued to fund the office. And then somewhere about 1981, uh, the, uh, there was a little uh, proviso in the law that uh, said that no, those funds would not fund the fire marshal's office, uh, that he will in fact go into the general fund. Now. I believe that happened much earlier than 1981, but I think legally they cleaned house in 81. Uh, I've, I've gone back to 1965 interviewing uh, former employees and nobody can remember that, that uh, money. Interesting enough, the insurance industry, it's called the fire marshal tax, and the industry, uh, uh, if I talk to some of my colleagues in the insurance industry, think that uh, they're still funding the office. So, and I want to give credit uh, very, very uh, carefully. I've talked to a number of different organizations and groups. Would they support the reuniting of this fund with the State Fire Marshal Division? And no one that I have asked has refused us. And there's a, the Fire Service, I'm pleased to announce, has named, the Minnesota Fire Service has named the State Fire Marshal Tax now referred to as the State Fire Marshal Funding Bill, uh, as their number one priority. And I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, support from the National Fire Sprinkler Association, uh, Region 15, and others uh, clearly uh, is, is appreciated. Uh, we're going to try to get that money back and back to fund the office. In 99, it was 3.77 million. Uh, our budget is about 4.2. Uh, but I do a lot of contracting with the Department of Health and uh, Department of Corrections and Department of Children, Family, and Learning for various inspection programs. So hopefully uh, I'm providing with you information tonight, not advocacy. Uh, it's not in the governor's budget, but I know it will be an issue that will be uh, debated uh, firmly and uh, with some enthusiasm by uh, some of the sponsors of it. We feel that we are a service organization to a number of groups. And 
we feel that if we're properly funded and staffed, then we can provide the level of service to you that will allow you to do the kind of job you want to do uh, to your clients and customers and the citizens of Minnesota. I'm very proud of our staff, and I, I recognize Katie Letourneau Bjorgi over here on our Sprinkler program, and Dr. Pearson in the, in the back, uh, consorting with the uh, Paul Jensen group. Um, <laughs> I did hear they were coming to town, and certainly there there, there is proof. Uh, and welcome to Minnesota. A number of other issues that are. Uh, certainly timely. I'd like to talk for a minute about fire deaths. A sobering topic, clearly, after, after a dinner. But if we are looking for ways to measure our fire prevention and fire safety activities, certainly looking at fire death rates uh, is one indice. In 1999, 60 people perished. In 19, in, in 2000, 48. Now, I think there's some significant factors here. Of those 48 people who perished, 30 were in a residential or dwelling. 12 were in vehicles. Two were suicides. And four were explosions. I think that uh, we will, as we dissect that a little further, we find that where we live is the single most unsafe occupancy uh, in our society, where we live, home, home. Over 67% of all fire deaths, both in Minnesota and nationwide, are, <clears throat> are where we live. From a fire code standpoint, we probably do the very least in terms of code requirements and regulations is where we live. There are two groups that are at the greatest risk, and when you go home and your significant other said, now what did you learn tonight at Lido's? Uh, maybe this is a fact that you can rattle off. And truly that our seniors, 60 and over, and our children, 10 and under, are at the greatest risk. If you're not in that uh, two spans, then high probability you're a caregiver. Now, on um, Friday at 9 o'clock is a first hearing on a fire-resistant cigarette bill. Uh, this technology, we've been waiting for it for a long time, it exists. You put a cigarette down in an ashtray or you drop a cigarette into an upholstered chair and it goes out. Fire-resistant, it's being actually marketed. Uh, there's a brand today uh, that's available, it's a Merit cigarette. If you recall, uh, many for those of you that were uh, practiced that uh, foul, filthy habit, uh, you put a cigarette in an ashtray, and uh, it just kept right on burning. And that was by design, so people wouldn't pick them up and relight them. You ever you ever uh, see anyone smoke a pipe? Which, unlike cigarettes, is a foul, filthy habit. Pipe smoking is an art form. <laughs> Some of, some of the laughter is, is knowing that, uh, that I am a pipe smoker. You ever see a pipe smoker continually relighting the pipe? Well, there is no additive to keep it burning uh, in pipe tobacco. I've fought for years for new upholstered furniture standards at the national level, testified in Congress and for the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, urging them to move away from voluntary to more uh, Defined standards. I think California Technical Bulletin 117, uh, wonderful. Uh, a name of Gordon Dumont, maybe some of you know that name, uh, uh, a person that has been a, a world class leader in this arena. So either you make the upholstered furniture safer or you make the cigarettes safer. But clearly, um, in Minnesota, reflects um, the national experience, one out of uh, Cigarette smoking is the number one cause of fire deaths in Minnesota and the U.S. In Minnesota, one out of every four fire deaths are cigarette related. It's the seventh cause of fire. Uh, I'm going to play mathematical games with you, but you have to go down to number seven as a cause. 
but in terms of the uh, explanation of fire deaths, it's number one. So if this technology exists today, I intend to vigorously support that effort. Another thing at looking at the statistics is 12 vehicles, 30 in residences, but 12 in vehicles. And uh, I've just uh, been uh, given the honor of establishing an automobile task force through our National Association of State Fire Marshals. We're heading to the National Institute of Science and Technology next week. And we are going to kick off a two-year study of automobile fires. Some of the preliminary data indicates that uh, you're about four times safer in an airplane uh, cabin than you are in an automobile in terms of fire resistive and fire retardant materials around you. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity. The other fact, and we could make a whole discussion of this issue, I want to read you just um, the numbers of, um, of what the blood alcohol level is of some of these people. And keep in mind that, that they're, some of them are caregivers. 0.260. 0 0.170, Now, I would submit to you that some of these souls uh, departed. Uh, <laughs> if, if they took themselves out and no one else, you could you, you could see maybe the humor in that, or certainly that they felt no pain. But here, here the legislature is debating 0.08, and you got somebody here that's 0.419. Uh, for most of us, I believe would be a comatose uh, would be a description. And I'm not sure. And I, I'll just leave this point here: is that I'm not sure that the traditional fire prevention techniques, educating, use of smoke detectors, changing your battery, testing your smoke detectors. I'm not sure you reach somebody uh, with a .419. So maybe... Anyway. What's that? I'm sorry, Tom, interrupted. They wouldn't use smoke no, detectors anyway. No, absolutely not. Also, I want to look a little uh, further. We're, we're doing uh, uh, Minnesota, and I'm very proud of this state. Uh, notwithstanding some of our radio talk shows, uh, but we have a, a law, it's a little known law, but all fire deaths in Minnesota are autopsy. I have fought very hard for that. We thought we were going to lose it, and uh, we were able to prevent us from losing it. All fire deaths are autopsy, and I'm convinced that some of our senior citizens, when they take the hearing aid out of their ear and put, rest it on the, on the nightstand, or they're taking some pretty healthy or heavy uh, pain medication or maybe sleep medication uh, that maybe the, the traditional smoke detector isn't doing it. Maybe we need to look at something else. You know, they, they do have smoke detectors for people that are deaf. Maybe we should be, be emphasizing that. Uh, and as I say, some of these people uh, uh, never knew what hit them. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, we believe in the, in the greater fire community that we want to do all we can to reduce fire deaths. I'm particularly interested in the automobile piece um, because I'm, I'm concerned that the, with, the, with my brother or sister agency, the State Patrol, uh, that uh, we're double counting. So we need to coordinate very carefully with them. Did the crash kill them? Was the subsequent fire? And where do we go from there? So. The subject of another evening, but I, I just want to uh, give you just a, a little bit of insight there. Some of you are following, I, my sense is most of you are following this whole International Fire Code, International Building Code issue. It's, to me, it's one of the greatest code issues uh, that we are, have been confronted with. Minnesota has been a uniform fire code, uniform building code state for uh, uniform building since 1973, uniform fire codes since 75. This is a major pivot. A major, major pivot. And we have made the decision in the fire marshal's office, or more correctly, I'll, I have made the decision, 
that we will go with the International Fire Code. Now, for uh, some of you that, uh, that would have wished for a decision uh, for another code, uh, we are going to be very vigilant and careful that, that we, we do not go backwards. Uh, but clearly, the International Fire and Building Code are pro-sprinkler. There are some that argue that it may well be too pro-sprinkler. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, uh, sprinkler fire protection is an integral part uh, of those of those two codes. Like anything else, I think there's going to be a, a birthing period. A uh, uh, there will be problems. There will be uh, 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 chuck holes, whatever euphemism you want to use. But it would be a good world to see us all singing from the same piece of sheet music. And if I were in the private sector, and particularly if I were building across the country. Uh, the idea of having a standard, one standard nationwide, makes a lot of sense to me. I have been an admirer and supporter of NFPA, and, and continue to be, uh, but I do be feel that for Minnesota, and for uniformity, uh, the family of code argument uh, was a compelling one for me. There's a group that I would suggest that you watch very carefully, I happen to sit on it, uh, but uh, that, that in itself is not reason to watch it. Uh, it's the Construction Code Advisory Council. There's a creation in the Carlson administration. It's continued in the Ventura administration. And I believe that they are beginning to pull together the various code bodies at the state level and uh, are also arguing for uniformity and the, for the elimination of, of, uh, of conflicting code provisions. Remember, the Construction Code Advisory Council happens to be led by a very able architect, Dean Newens, but um, it's a group that I see some promise coming out of. In the subset of those issues is something that I see emerging in the arena of passive fire protection. Um, I'm old enough and have been in this business long enough to understand that redundancy is not a evil, uh, that systems need backup, need support. Uh, we are in the process, let me say the we pronoun, Dr. Pearson is in the process of drafting a, a for want of a better term, a bulletin to urge some caution as how passive fire protection is eliminated with the use of sprinklers. Now, I'll stand on my record as being a supporter of sprinklers, but it does bother me that the decision to, to take out some of the passive fire protection is not based on good fire protection criteria, but basically an economic consideration. I think there's room for both, is what I'm saying. I'm for fully sprinklered buildings, but I also recognize that buildings change use. And what might work very nicely for an office complex through the years, what do we know how that might change and how that use might change? Redundancy, as I say, is not an evil. Watch for the bulletin. We'll be disseminating it as widely as we can. Toward that end, uh, we also are in the process of rewriting the sprinkler rules. Uh, every time we open those rules up, it is contentious. Uh, I'm convinced that anyone in the sprinkler industry is, by definition, shy and retired. Uh, <laughs> not, uh, not known of strong opinion, uh, but uh, clearly we have a very tough sprinkler licensing program in Minnesota. And I am a little bit apologetic, not too much, about your previous speaker that, that talked about uh, his experiences with uh, uh, sprinklers around the country, but uh, we work very hard at making sure that people are licensed and uh, we have an understanding of plan review and inspections, and we're, as I say, we're hoping to capture those revenues. I think that's a good point to mention that the sprinkler industry is supporting an initiative to take 
all of the revenues that are generated from our sprinkler program and put them in a dedicated account. And I want to thank publicly the industry for introducing the bill. Uh, we've got it covered both ways. We've got it covered in the um, as a standalone bill, and it's also covered in the fire marshal funding, fire marshal tax bill. So one way or the other, we hope that uh, that we can uh, can if the industry pays for a service, they ought to receive the service in total. Not the, not the quote surplus going into the general fund. In other words, the, if the industry taxes itself, then they should have the full benefit of the service. Now, how does it? How does that work out? Well, we visited, and in, in, uh, this is just a calendar year 2000. We visited 215 properties, did close to 300 inspections, issued 386 permits, and did 610 plan reviews. Now, if you've been following that quick math, you'd say, now, wait a minute, how, how could they issue 386 permits and, and do 610 plan reviews? Well, I would submit to you that we're doing some more than once. <laughs> <laughs> and if you plot those on a graph, uh, and Katie, that uh, uh, may be a, a subject of, uh, for offline with, with some of our colleagues, but uh, there are certain it's a certain small number that have a number of repeats. And it seems to me that after two or three times that there really is not a rational uh, reason why that product shouldn't be approved. Now I grant you that we live in a very complex technical world, uh, but it seems to me that after three submittals of a set of plans, it ought to, ought to go through. And we're not in the business of drafting plans. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility, clearly, though, is to give the best plan review we can and also get out there and do the inspection. And uh, I have been anxious about our ability to do the inspections. I would like to beef that up. Our plan review time has gone as high as six weeks uh, and, and as low as two. Uh, but clearly, these people are, like Katie, are extremely busy. And, uh, and turn out a good product. I might add on, on uh, some of the more complex ones, Rich, you weighed in on uh, plan review as well. And uh, that's appreciated. You know, in another life and uh, subject of another discussion is that, uh, that uh, when the state hired me, they got a twofer. Uh, that's not to reflect my size. Uh, <laughs> although this size was not achieved by uh, carelessly missing meals. Uh, but I'm also the director of the Office of Pipeline Safety, and I have been doing that since 94. I've been the marshal since 87, but the director of the Office of Pipeline since 94. That's a fascinating subject. It's clearly what's out of sight is out of mind. You'd be interested to know that there's over 50,000 miles of pipeline in Minnesota. We have about 17 people who work full-time inspecting pipelines. We're one of three states in the Union that have both state and federal authority on intra- and interstate pipelines. Uh, a very aggressive pipe pipeline safety program. Uh, some top, top-notch engineers, uh, pipeline engineers that are engine uh, licensed in a number of states. Uh, and we're very proud of that group as well. And what we've been able to do in the last, uh, since 94, is we'll take a house explosion and we'll put a pipeline engineer alongside a fire investigator and we'll figure out what, the, what happened. And we've got the jurisdiction covered from the center of the street uh, all the way into the uh, bowels of the building. And between the two of them, uh, they'll figure out uh, why, why that blew. Clearly, if you follow uh, the news, uh, we've had some rather spectacular explosions, not the least of which is, is on my mind, is St. Cloud. And uh, clearly, as the whole fiber optics world comes into being, uh, we're hitting things that obviously people never knew were there in the first place. And, and watch for more hits, uh, bluntly. We've got a call before you dig program, you've, you've seen that advertised. 
Gopher State one call. I remember when I first came to Minnesota, I couldn't believe that you, a gopher became a mascot. Uh, <laughs> but however, however it works, uh, gophers are, are rather fondly thought of, uh, at least from a, from a uh, symbolic standpoint. Uh, we call that program Gopher State One Call. I was looking at some statistics we just put together that Hennepin County had between 100 and 150,000 requests for lo locates, and that's just one county. Between 100 and 150,000. So it's not by accident that some of this stuff gets hit. And if it's not too, uh, I'm just reviewing the case for about ready to go to court. Uh, the um, the uh, issue you remember with Northwest Airlines when uh, when uh, Quest, formerly U.S. West, was hit, and all of a sudden Northwest Airlines uh, uh, ticketing and, and uh, reservation system uh, took a uh, uncharacteristically uh, even for Northwest. Um, <laughs> we'll edit that piece of the text. Um, just brought around that, that uh, facility to a halt and, uh, and countless hundreds of thousands of dollars and that's not to mention other businesses that went down because the, uh, among other things the, uh, the line was uh, terribly mislocated uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a case clearly in, uh, in contention as we speak but it doesn't take a metal giant to figure that uh, before you put a spade through a gas line uh, be it mechanized or not uh, pick up the phone and call and get it marked. If you want to know the second largest county, which I thought was interesting uh, in terms of volume, is Dakota County. Uh, so we know that, that things are, are growing pretty rapidly in Dakota. If you start, you know, statistics are always fun to work with, and we have a marvelous graphics person. Uh, if you start doing it on a per capita basis, uh, you really change the picture of locates in Minnesota and you find that the what we used to call in geography as the exurbs remember there's the central city and then the suburbs and then the exurbs and you, as you work your way out into rural the exurbs ringing uh, the metro area are uh, very high in usage both from a uh, commercial and, uh, and private uh, homeowner standpoint well those are just kind of a potpourri of things that uh, that are on our mind in the fire marshal's office. A little view, if you will, from the bridge to quote Arthur Miller, uh, looking forward uh, into the new millennium, uh, renewed effort in juvenile fire study and center intervention. Between 40 and 60 percent of all set fires are set by people under 18. Uh, we need to intervene. We have a very dynamic fellow, you heard his name mentioned, uh, Dan Bernardi earlier this evening, uh, hard, hard work, setting up task forces all over the state, trying to get this fire and other collateral organizations together to, to challenge uh, respective communities to do something about juvenile fire setup. Uh, sprinklers, I think the future for sprinklers is uh, exploding. Uh, I think we're gonna see more and more uh, sprinklers uh, being used. Um, I think there's some more responsibility uh, that goes with that. Uh, I think we've been lucky. It does bother me when we have Omega and experiences like that. Uh, fortunately, the impact of Omega in Minnesota was, was certainly less than other parts of the country. Uh, but I, I'll never forget talking to the president of Omega, asking him what happened, why doesn't it work, why the failure rate, and the guy says, I don't know. And he was honest, I mean, I salute his honesty, but, uh, but I would submit that he was in the business to know why his product didn't work. Uh, so for those of us that rely on sprinklers to work, uh, I think the standards have got to, uh, we've got to be ever vigilant there. I worry about craft labor over time. And uh, are people going into those kind of trades? I hear stories that, uh, uh, that trying to find good, competent people is getting tougher and tougher. And we're relying more and more on, on those sprinkler systems. We've got a new fire incident reporting system. It's called EMFERS 5.0. Uh, 
you might be interested in knowing that 85% of the fire departments in Minnesota report to the fire marshal's office. Not because they like the fire marshal's office, but I, I think they report because they want to know and they want their fire history compiled with their, with their neighbors. And we've got some copies of that uh, here tonight. Uh, see, uh, see Dr. Pearson. Uh, for those of you that have never seen fire in Minnesota, it's nationally recognized as, uh, as a uh, wonderful uh, teaching tool. It's designed to literally uh, take the pages out of it. It's camera ready, and uh, you can use it for a wide range of, of fire safety, fire prevention activities. Arson. Arson's the number one cause of fire in Minnesota. It's been that way for the last two years. Fifteen percent of all known fires are deliberately set. I started, as I mentioned, in 1975. I felt in 1975 that about one in four fires are deliberately set. I still believe that. Uh, I believe that we are getting better at detecting. I believe that fires that were once listed as unknown or suspicious are being properly called. Uh, clearly, when you add to the component of volunteer firefighters, uh, and we're asking those volunteer firefighters to risk their lives, their futures, the futures of their family, their community, to fight a fire. In many cases, somebody was trying to sell it to the insurance company. I think that's a moral outrage. And so we will continue to, to uh, strengthen laws on arson. I think we have some of the best in the country, but uh, it's ever vigilant. Uh, one, uh, one thing that uh, just emerged just on the horizon is the term negligent fire. Uh, we are going to have to redefine that definition because several prosecutors and several judges have told us in court cases clearly that unless uh, the, the burden on proving a negligent fire is way too great. And when we have somebody that, that is so careless uh, to cause great damage, uh, there must be a way to bring those people to, to account. I have enjoyed being your fire marshal. I now have the distinction of being the longest serving state fire marshal in the country. It took me two states to do it. I still find the job interesting. Uh, I still find uh, uh, challenges at, at every step. But one of the things that I've learned and, and continually relearned is that uh, we need support. And we're in this effort together. And that one of the most uh, non-productive words in our English language is turf. And what we really need is to identify the issue properly, work together in a consensus manner, build a coalition of people, go out and solve the problem, dissolve the coalition and go on to the next one. And really I think that that's the future, what it holds. That how can you bring to the problem the knowledge and expertise, and how can you contribute to a solution? And I think we can make a difference. In my span of, of uh, fire service, I've seen fire deaths reduced over half. I think Smoke detectors are a large explanation of that, but I also think that uh, public fire safety education has played a major role. And I think we can still do better. I look at our colleagues in, in MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They changed a nation's drinking habits and affected several industries in a relatively short period of time and if you analyze how they did it, their message was crystal clear. And uh, my sense is that they'll probably be successful, even with point oh eight. So clearly we've got some models to follow. Uh, we've got a real challenge still ahead of us. I think it's a great industry to be associated with. And I thank you for your attention. was a potpourri of different points of view. There may be some that may want a little, I don't know if we have time for equal time, but, but clearly are there any questions or comments that someone might have, please? Uh, question for you, Tom, and what are your, uh, what are you finding out from other of your
your colleague, Fire Marshal Ron, the United States, in terms of the uh, acceptance of the International Building and Fire Codes in their states. Are we seeing you know, some large number of states that are going to be accepting it, like Minnesota's going to be pushing for? I see a reduction. There, are, there are, you, had, you had four choices, if you, if you looked at it, all possible choices. I think the choices are Dow down to two. One of them is the International Fire Code, International Building Code, the International Family of Codes. The other is NFPA. Now, NFPA has just recently liaison with the Western Fire Chiefs over the Uniform Fire Code. Uh, I see NFPA on the East Coast, where there was a strong history of NFPA codes. I'm going down the eastern seaboard. Uh, but uh, clearly Califor or, uh, California is unique, and I'll explain that in a minute. But west of the Mississippi, that was not a general statement. I was trying to refer to from a code standpoint. Having, having been educated in California, I have some loyalty uh, to at least a portion of it. Um, I'm, I'm still hopeful, if you look at the reliance of the international, for example, the International Fire Code to certain NFPA codes and standards, I'm still hopeful that, that we'll see a, 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 a gathering, uh, of a, a coming together. Um, what we need to watch is in various legislators, legislative bodies across the country of code start being determined in the legislative arena. That could change the whole picture. In Minnesota, to date, it's like the Department of Public Safety's state fire marshal that ultimately makes the decision, or the Department of Administration, the building code division, that makes the decision. If the legislature starts mandating what code is going to be accepted, then, then all bets are off. And I noticed that, like in Florida, uh, NFPA was successful in getting it, getting it named as the fire code. Interesting enough, though, Florida had three different codes. So clearly, anybody that came in with one code, I thought, had a cogent argument. California, as I mentioned earlier, we're not sure just which way that's going. Uh, there is a body that determines what edition of the code it decided, no, it wanted to go with the NFPA code. And they're both good codes. But I, I'm, I'm convinced that whatever one adopts in a community, community I'm going to define as the state, boy, they should be compatible. And I think there's an there's a imperative that if somebody complies as an example with the fire code, but is in violation of the building code, or vice versa, that's not right. We shouldn't put uh, our citizens, our industry, in that dilemma. I think, I think as code regulators, we have a responsibility to make sure that these things fit. And I've signed an agreement with the Building Code Division that we will adopt jointly building and fire codes, no more of this. And I have to say I'm embarrassed uh, in my in past life is that, you know, why weren't we on the exact same edition of the code? And uh, that'll never happen again. I, I, I feel very strong about that. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer, and I do design fire systems uh, for the building, for the industry, for all those things. So, so first thing I ask sometimes to the owners, what do you want, to protect people or protect the property? Because two different concepts start now, codes and all those things start working on two different things after the building. Sometimes they say, we want to protect both. Well, that's easy. But when they say, we want to protect the building, so the sprinkler system, that thing, that thing, forget about the alarm system. And which I believe the building for the law that you know. So, so the, the, the thing is that if we can look at the thing, which way the fire is increasing water, yes, it is increasing water. What is happening? People people are safer than before, properties are safer than before. We should look into that and see where the mistakes are or what we can do better. Uh, well, 
uh, I think we have made some significant uh, steps, uh, but I, I think it's the price of an internal vigilance. Uh, I, I'm, we're looking at, at uh, some of these uh, high-rise, high-pile storage uh, that historically has been a warehouse configuration, and all of a sudden we're going to run the general public through uh, all these aisles, and we're going to hire somebody at a minimum wage uh, to the, probably be the first one out the door. Uh, in a fire scenario, um, I, I think there, there's always new challenges. Uh, I, I'd like to think we could have both protect people and protect property. Uh, I, I, I would, uh, if, you, if I were a property owner and you asked me that question, uh, I would say oh, that's a choice, that's a Hobson's choice I'm not going to make. Um, Sprinklers have been recognized as both property protection and life-saving uh, features, uh, particularly the uh, quick response heads. I'm for getting people up and out. Uh, clearly, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, the smoke detector has probably done more to save residential lives than anything. Um, any other single feature? But that's a, that's a complex question. Uh, I, I think we're doing better in some areas, and we're we're in we're, but we're creating other environments that uh, that may be far worse. So I mean, I, I think it's a it's a continual vigilance. But I think that fire officials, and I, I wish there were more tonight here, but I mean, from the public sector, excuse me. Uh, we also have to have the courage to say what's not a fire hazard. And I think that sometimes our credibility is damaged when we stand up and say, oh my God, this is, we can't do it. But what's the data set? I remember that in the state of Oregon, I was in Washington, Oregon had a, had a, uh, uh, only a, uh, an attendant could fill a, a gas tank at a, at a filling station. And they touted this, you know, that this was a fire safety thing. Well, I looked at Oregon's data, I looked at Washington's data. I couldn't tell any difference between whether an attendant came out and filled your gas tank, or you filled I thought the biggest decision on, on fires and gas stations was that when the price of uh, gasoline went over a dollar a gallon. Uh, people, you know, it was 35 cents a year, they might be a little careless, but at a buck a gallon, people got more careful. I mean, and that's, you know, you've got to look at, I think, the economics issue. But um, I, I worry about, I'll just say one quick thing and go to you. Uh, I feel that we're moving in a positive direction in the sprinkler industry. I'm concerned about the alarm industry in Minnesota. I'd sure like to see that uh, regulation tightened up. And, and uh, what am I saying there? Uh, um, that the people are incompetent? Certainly not. But you know, it, it does seem a little <coughs> bit incongruous that we go to a, a to a very detailed sprinkler licensing program, and yet the alarm system. And I listened to some of the folks in the low voltage arena and I listened to some of their arguments with the State Board of Electricity. I understand there's dialogues have gone on for 13 years and they haven't they got a resolution yet. Uh, it seems to me that the alarm industry needs some type of home. Does it have to be under the fire marshal's office? No, but the fire marshal's office needs to be a player in what the resolution is. Uh, i got a hand there and then we'll go to Mr. Nelson. There. But, yeah, also the risk of sounding like a little practical too well, just a little clarification. The State Fire Marshal's Division and their um, permitting and, and generating revenues brings in or, or has revenues in the, in the area of $10 million. The legislation is giving you a budget of four. What you're saying is six goes into the general fund and we're all squawking about the governor giving us rebates back in our mailboxes. The state fire marshal's division generated that additional six million dollars. We'll never get access to it, never get to use it, and the general public, in essence, will get it back in their mailbox. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm that's basically it. Those those numbers are not right, but the concept okay. is what the you're saying is, is that you know, we spend a certain amount of money to run the sprinkler program and. Uh, in a, anything in excess of revenue in excess of that goes into the general fund. There are two two schemes, scenarios out there now. One is a bill 
that specifically says all sprinkler revenues stays in a dedicated account and rolls forward year after year. There's another scenario in this fire marshal tax that if the state fire marshal's office raises the money, it stays in the fire marshal's office. And which one was the, which was, was the early 1900s? That was the, actually the fire marshal tax, that was 1913. The state in the state fire marshal's fund? Yes, it did it up until I think about 1960 and then it was lost. But, um, you know, as I say... So if you want more money back in our mailboxes, you just need to charge more money. <laughs> but you see, yeah, I, mean, I follow your argument, but I'm I'm not a raiser of funds so that I can increase the general fund. I I believe that that I'm a I'm I should charge a reasonable fee to carry out the duties that are enumerated in the sprinkler uh, legislation. I don't know, I say that yeah. cheap. I know you do, but I, that's what you are. Yeah, I, I but I I would if I were paying a fee, I would expect to see my fee being used to uh, regulate or assist me in, in, in a job I'm trying to do. And uh, there's a difference between a, what's, what's a reasonable fee and making money. And I noticed that my colleagues in the State Building Code Division, their life changed immeasurably when they, when they got the building fees, building code fees, placed, dedicated into their <coughs> account. And they're turning around and saying to a local building official, back to your question, I think you, building official of, of, uh, of uh, St. Cloud, I think you need to go to the next national discussion on the International Building Code, and I'm going to pay your way. And so they have got people involved who normally couldn't get involved in the process. I mean, I think it's kind of awkward that once again, Rich Pearson is on the NFPA 13 committee. I'm very delighted about that. And we're funding him to go through a arrangement with the Fire Marshal Association of Minnesota that buys him an airplane ticket. Uh, you know, what, what's wrong with that picture? You know, and, uh, and, and yet you have fees coming in from the sprinkler program that would be most appropriate to, I mean, here, here's, here's somebody participating in the actual code that we're using to enforce the sprinkler regulations. And I mean, and that's the kind of situation. Now, as I said, I don't want to make a, not a to make a political statement, I'm just trying to tell you economically where we are. I would say in Minnesota, it's a unique position. It's a Republican House. They're not very fond of a Democratic Senate. The Democratic Senate is very fond of a Republican House. And they're both not very fond of the governor, and he, he reciprocates. <laughs> but, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking from a heretical, heretical standpoint. I'm, I'm in the middle, halfway through a second book. And anybody who writes a book that says, do I stand alone? Uh, clearly, I mean, that, that's one of his themes, is, is the disassociation, if you will, between the governor and the legislature. And here they are confronted with, with a problem in, in our government is needing all needing to work together. And then the race begins, who can give more money back? And I just raised the question is that those decisions demand the ability to compromise and establish goals and objectives and, uh, and get some kind of consensus. No, Mr. Nelson, and then we'll go to. I got just two quick questions, Tom. One is, when do you expect you're going to adopt or uh, change over to the uh, international code? We'll propose it about about July one. Okay. An effective date about a year later. Now those are so roughly mid the Canadian thousand. about you know about right. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, roughly in that in that uh, vernacular. But the idea is to, and we're already beginning training, is to make, this is a major pivot. And so we need to train people before the code becomes effective. Right. And, but, you know, the effective date may move up a little bit. I mean, but roughly that's the scenario. Okay. And the other follow-up question is, on, you talk about fire alarms. Um, currently, I think we're on the, what, NFPA 93 code? 
Is there, I mean, there's 96 and 99 beyond that. Any idea when that will come forward to the new generation? It's on a three-year cycle. I, I, Rich, would you know that? Yeah, we currently run the correct. We currently reference the, the 1993 edition of, of NFPA 72. Um, I don't think. I, I think the uh, IFC is only going to get you the, the, the 96. There, there is an interest in, in adopting a newer version of 72, but that would mean quite a, quite a bit of amendments. And so I actually just had a discussion on that today. If that is something important to folks, they need to let let people know we're doing that with the sprinkler standard is adopting a newer version that is referenced in the IFC. But what that means is many, many more amendments possible. Well, I guess the only reason I bring it up is, is that it's the 99 code where the survivability of the alarm cable comes to, to being. Oh, yeah. And it does, it's not in anything before 99. Right. And if we're talking about bringing the alarm industry leaps forward, yeah. I think that's reason I asked the question. Okay, well let's let's visit that. Um, and clearly, as I say, we're in the process of deciding on a number of issues. Uh, the propane people have been in to talk about, they have a similar argument about what edition of the NFPA 58 to use. And of course there's some provisions in the latest edition of NFPA 58 uh, that we, we can't accept in Minnesota. So at a minimum if we go, we'll have to take those out. I'm, I'm talking about propane tanks on roofs. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to go there. Fish houses. <laughs> One more thing. There. Okay, and then another gentleman there. Go ahead. I should follow up then with you or with. Uh, Rich is a good yeah, contact okay. to be sure. Uh, you had a question, sir. Yeah, I basically want, just want to go back to that funding issue that you were talking about. And I'm really curious. What do you? Within what kind of time frame do you see a realistic possibility that the legislature will swing your way and start funding you? Is there anything that we need to do? Uh, is this 10 years from now, 5 years from now, is it in the works? I'm really curious. Oh, that, I, that, I think that would be really good. That would be possible. Well, I can just tell you that this is a factual <laughs> answer to that, not an advocacy position, is that the uh, uh, there are almost daily strategy sessions right now with certain key fire service leaders. Uh, the bill is written, it's about ready to be introduced. They're going for broke this session. Uh, so it is, uh, it's very topical. And uh, we can certainly keep you informed of how it's doing. Uh, the best of all worlds, I think this is maybe a little optimistic, if it passes, uh, it'll probably take about two years to, to implement it. Uh, not necessarily the sprinkler piece, but this fire marshal funding uh, effort. But I mean, it's it, it's now. Is I guess the point I'm trying to make. Okay. Then my further question to that would be: How do you perceive the governor to react to this? Because we know in the past Arnie Carlson vetoed some sprinkler bills. Oh, we remember that well. How, yeah. yeah, we know. Okay. Okay. But how does the present governor look at that? Would he be objecting to it, or would he be? Is well, he the kind of guy that probably go along with it because it would make sense? To the, uh, one of the most exciting pieces of news I heard recently uh, was that the Speaker of the House, who I might add is on the bill, a conservative Republican, um, I believe he's the number two author, or has promised to be the number two author, uh, argued that it's not new money. It is a reallocation of existing money. In state government parlance, that's very, very important. In other words, money that was going into the general fund now goes to the fire marshal. But the flip side of it, money coming out of the general fund that goes to the fire marshal can now go somewhere else. It's a watch. Two ships in the night. So uh, by ruling, that's the house ruling, uh, is, is, is a very significant step. Now clearly, uh, we're going to have to do our best to educate the powers that be that this is not a new program. This is absolutely restoring something that has a strong historical base. And there is a, the governor has been on record as saying he likes fees for service. In other words, if people want certain levels of services, they should be prepared to pay for them. So it's not absolutely incongruous on some of his viewpoints. But uh, clearly it's, it's going to be a long, uh, long struggle, but I, there are some 
good men and women that are that are uh, that are lining up to uh, and are, are working on it as we speak. All right, sir. Is there any strong opposition to it from only the Department of Revenue or Department of Finance? <laughs> okay, public sector. But they're a little bit like uh, they're Vinny. a little bit about uh, they're a little bit like uh, uh, you know remember that breakfast cereal ad that Mikey doesn't like anything. <laughs> Dedicated funds have never been a real fund. I mean, they'd rather have one big pot that you can s throw money around in. How about, how about the public sector? Any groups coming? I haven't heard any public sector opposition. I've, I've had people come up and free will. Uh, I was talking about this with the Sheriff's Association. They, we work with them very closely on arson cases. And uh, they jumped right on it. Does this mean that we would have more fire investigators? Or we could get one quicker. I mean, that was that was the question. Yes, it does. Yes, yes. I mean, two answers. More and quicker. So they, they do it on that one. The insurance industry loves it. Uh, they, they they're kind of the high moral ground. We've been collecting and paying this for years. And uh, in reality, us, the policyholders, have been paying it. Anything else? Okay, go ahead, sir. What's the status of um, residential sprinklers and warranty dwellings? Well, I, I want to say but thank you for that question. Um, I think there's a real need for leadership here, and uh, I think we've had some some starts, some some good work done, and and we've had some stops, and I think we need to literally call together a, a group of. Uh, the best minds we can find and figure out how we kickstart that issue again. Um, I know there's, um, they had a seminar and I had high hopes for it. And it was the barriers to residential sprinklers. And I, I rushed out there and got a seat and I was not a speaker. I mean, I just sat in the audience and listened. And it was, I mean, it was they outlined the problems pretty well. But I didn't see anybody with any vision coming forth with some solutions. And I kind of feel that, that we need to uh, uh, set aside some long-held beliefs, fire service, industry, installers, and so forth, and, and take, a, take a fresh look at it. Um, From a code standpoint, Tom, that's something you'd like to see? I, I, I'm a real believer in residential sprinklers. But, but I'll tell you that I'm also a, a, a political watcher, and you talk about residential sprinklers and the Home Builders Association, uh, you know, they go into contractions. Uh, hard or other at Atomic Park, you know, and uh, I, I think we've got to get beyond that barrier. We've also got to get beyond uh, some bids by some uh, sprinkler uh, contractors that, that uh, if you don't want the job, don't bid it. Uh, some of these bids coming in at, at way more than they should. And I know that they can be done for 75 cents a piece, or 75 cents a square foot. But I have to, when, when you see some bids like three and four dollars uh, a square foot, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm there. There must be some extraordinary problems to deliver water to that property that I'm not seeing. So. Uh, yeah. But I, I think we need to sit down quietly and as unemotionally as we can and jumpstart that program. The Governor's Council on Fire Prevention and Control, your president was mentioning it, uh, the minutes, I was in that meeting this morning, uh, has, a, has just empowered a group to start looking at that question. And I can remember in the legislature two years ago offering a free brochure that would go to every new home buyer that was sitting down with a contractor to build a house. We provide a brochure free. And all we wanted in the statute law was that, that if you were building a new home, you uh, were, <coughs> were required to hand out a brochure. Didn't cost you anything other than, you know, you want to have an upgrade for your kitchen? You want to upgrade carpets? You want upgrade here, there, here, you ever thought about residential sprinklers? Just, just a brochure. We couldn't get that through. And, I mean, that was such an innocuous bill. 
And, uh, you know, and, and when the home builders come out and say, and fought that one right to a stop, I thought, you know, boy, we've got a lot of dialogue to go with to, uh, to convince those people that we're not the enemy. Go ahead, sir. Just a, a follow-on to that, um, and if you're interested, I can put you in contact with the uh, fire chief from uh, Barrington, Illinois. Um, I'm actually from our Chicago office and I uh, sat through a presentation at our local SFP chapter where he talked uh, strictly about this issue. They're one of probably about nine or ten communities now in the Chicagoland area that do have uh, ordinances that require residential sprinklers in those dwellings. And <clears throat> they've gotten through some of the water supply issues uh, and they have a lot of uh, very remote areas that have many of the water supplies. Um, and what they've been able to do based on looking at it outside the box, outside of standard requirements per se. Uh, and they've been able to get sprinklers installed in some of these massive homes in here to tell us 6,000, 7,000 square feet or 95 cents up through maybe a dollar or 35 square. Yeah. So. And, and you know, somebody is building a six to 7,500 square feet home. The cost of sprinkling something like that right. is uh, you know, the fabric choice in the bedroom is probably more. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, no, and I, when, I'm talk, when you're talking about these, uh, you know, half a, or uh, three quarters of a million to two million dollar homes, you know, what is the cost of sprinkling it? And, you know, from a fire department standpoint, fighting a fire in, in that kind of structure, that's a significant size structure. Mm -hmm. Multi levels, you know, and all the way it goes. Uh, I've not, I've, the resolve is still there, but I think we need to look at a, maybe a, a, a slightly different way to do it. And I don't want my remarks to be taken as critical. I'll stand behind my comments about home builders. But I'm thinking that, that, that some of the ways we've tried it in the past uh, were probably good for that point in time, but now we need to do something maybe a little more dramatic. Tom, you know it. Have you ever talked to the insurance industry to see what they're about? Yeah, you know, and, and you know, you get, you know, you know what people are more concerned about? Water damage. More concerned about water damage than they are fire in many cases. Sprinkler industry, I think the best policy you can find is 10%. But, you know, fire, your fire portion of your homeowners is going down. You know, on your homeowner's policy, the big, the big nut, the big cost of the premium is, is theft. Theft. I mean, that's what's driving it. Fire is going down. I'm, I look at Maple Grove. I'm very impressed with a couple of things Maple Grove has done recently. Uh, where they've got some new construction sprinkler. They've followed through and they've shrunk the size of the uh, cul-de-sacs and the widths of the road and so forth. But there were some trade-offs and the industry stepped up and said, you bet, we'll take, we'll sprinkler. Uh, so, I mean, I think it can be done. I think we need to look at some of those examples. But you can't say, sprinkler it, and then do all the other things too. There's got to be an incentive. There's some give and take in here. Well, you've been a really patient audience, and uh, it has been a pleasure to speak with you, and at least we're involved in an activity that uh, uh, there's lots to be done. Working together, I think, is the answer. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Brace. It's always good to hear from you, and we always appreciate your helpful staff, too. I know when I've called here many times, you get a lot of good opinions and advice. And no. Um, just a few other comments here. Uh, the NFPA convention is in Anaheim, California this year. Starts on Mother's Day. For those of you that don't want to be around your mother, you can uh, go to the NFPA convention. Um, the Society of Fire Protection Engineers also has uh, quite a few.